introduced you. I just have a number of different things to say. But what you can see in front of you on this screen are our different branch events that will be coming up on the 14th of December and then in January, February and March. So I do hope you can come then. My name's Kath White. I'm the ex-chair of the, of the GA, Tyne and Weir branch. And I'm standing in for Brenda Turnbull, our present chair today. <clears throat> just before I start, if I can just remind everybody to, to mute themselves while Jill's talking, that would be good. And a quick reminder that everybody is welcome to attend our events, whether you're a GA member or not. They are free, although donations are welcome, and we encourage you to join the GA. We are very keen to hear from you about topics that you would find useful in our lecture series. And you can see these contact details, Brenda, Louise, and Amy underneath that slide. So if you can write to any of the three of them with any of your ideas, that would be very welcome. I have a reminder for you to check out the GA's Geography Education Online or GEO website, which is very useful for those of you in years 12 and 13, especially if you're catching up on material that you missed in <laughs> lockdown earlier this year. Them. Right. Can I can I just remind those people that have just joined? Could you just um, mute yourselves while we're going through just some of the, the things that we need to before starting, please? Thank you. So the the GEO website produced by the GA has really good materials and services, and they're excellent in quality and much cheaper if you are a GA member. As you'll know, if you've done Zoom, we have a chat function. And because it's wonderful that so many people are part of this talk, what I want to do today is to just for you to save the chat function just for your questions, please. Normally, I would say put your emails on it to get a certificate for this talk. But if you could just email either Brenda, Louise or Amy for your certificates, that would be fine. In wanting to um, have a certificate, we need you to give your full name and email address so we can send you it. And please will you include all the names if you're watching in a group. But these email certificates are, are very useful for your UCAS personal statements, for school prizes, and even parents love to see them. So as I say, just email us all, email Amy or email Louise, and we'll make sure that you get them. I would like to introduce to you today, Dr. Jill Miller, who was the president of the GA last year. And last year, she gave us an excellent talk about Ebola and jiggers, highlighting the social and cultural aspects of health. Jill is a development geographer who's had a long experience of teaching in schools, further and higher education. She's worked as a consultant for a number of A-level exam boards, and she is the author of the A-level text, Emerging Superpowers, China and India. She's passionate about international development, and in particular, how the global North can support effective development in the global South. She's written widely on a variety of themes, such as modern slavery, dealing with disease in Africa, as well as issues of transition from school to university and global citizenship. Jill is the senior lecturer emerita in the Department of Geography and International Development at the University of Chester. She's also a trustee of the Field Studies Council 
Five Talents UK and Music Place Northwest. And as Jill says of this talk, globalization is most often discussed in the context of the economy, but what is its impact on the environment? Is it inevitably bad news or is there hope for the future? Whose responsibility is it to manage the environment? And is anyone listening and responding? Jill's lecture is going to ask more questions than providing answers, but what she really wants to do is to make you all think. So Jill, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kath. And while you've been talking, I've just done a quick shift from my study upstairs where the internet connection was terrible and I've come down somewhere else. So this is a bit cox and fox. So you've got funny little things outside my, um, over my, uh, my right shoulder. So, so my apologies. Um, but anyway, it's really lovely to have the invitation to come to, to uh, Tyneside again because it's, it's kind of home and I hope you recognize the accent. So it's really, it's really lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to confess, first of all, that I began to talk with this lecture topic in 2012, and uh, that was fine. It had a different title, and I'll come back to that in the course of the lecture. But um, it, it, and it, this is kind of depressing, because um, I think I've been here before, and actually that's why I've called it, is anyone listening? Because actually, you know what? I don't think very many of us are actually listening. Anyway, as Kath says, more questions than answers, so, so here we go. Um, so some questions really to start off with. Can globalization actually help to address uh, environmental problems? It would be absolutely wonderful if it could. But, but another view is, is globalization actually the prime cause of destruction of, of the planet? So two, two ways of looking at things. But essentially, the environment is fundamentally conflicting with globalization. And this is what Naomi Klein said what the climate needs in order to avoid collapse is a contraction in humanity's use of resources. So we need to use less. What the economic model demands in order to avoid collapse is unfettered expansion. In other words, let's just consume more. Only one of these sets of rules can be changed and it's not nature. So let's see where that's gonna take us. So there's a view that the market, the, 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 the trading markets, can actually solve our problems because we can put a price on water, um, in particular we can put a price on land, put a price on forests. Um, it could have a, nature could have a value. So it actually becomes too expensive to use and therefore we'll use less of it. Another view is that globalization has driven environmental catastrophe. And Naomi Klein has described it, it's like putting capitalists in charge of uh, the environment, it's like, putting, uh, it's like putting foxes in charge of chickens. So there's absolutely no chance that the environment will survive if capitalists, i.e. Global, glo globalists, um, are, are in charge of uh, uh, the environment. And this is what Morris Strong says, the environment is not going to be saved by env environmentalists, they don't hold the levers of power. So what we do know about globalization, okay, we, you know, you've all got it, it's about interconnectedness, um, and it's essentially, absolutely as in, uh, associated with capitalism. And capitalism means economic growth. Uh, even now we're talking about, uh, you know, post-COVID, post the economy has got to grow. So that's kind of a given. And you can see there, in over the last 20 years, since 1990, 22, uh, times increase in the value of the global economy, we're using more construction materials, we're extracting more ores, we're burning more fuels, more um, agricultural uh, pollution, uh, got residues in, in the food we eat. So uh, everything is going in the, in the same upward direction. And we know that the global north has tight regulations on pollution and cleaner technology. And that, that's good news. Uh, but here's the kind of problem, the global south uh, 
we want them to industrialize because industrialization is the way that they're going to actually make their economies grow. But in so doing, it causes increasing pollution as well as receiving pollution. And pollution is an international and globalized uh, commodity. Rivers, oceans, transfers to atmospheric circulation, pollution is getting everywhere around the world. Everyone is suffering from pollution. Degradation is occurring everywhere. But we have to admit that some people contribute more than others. You know, in, in, the, in the global north, we are producing much more pollution than we are in, in the global south. So there straight away is a, a kind of a, a problem for us. You've heard of nimbyism, not in my backyard, and we're all very good at that. Uh, it's even seems to be a bit pre prevalent in, in, in the, the restrictions we've got uh, in tier three and tier two in lockdown. Uh, but I bet you haven't heard of Lulu's. Locally unwanted land uses. And there's quite a lot of those around. If we look at our local area, there's quite a few areas where we actually don't want um, some particular types of, of, of land use. Um, there are many familiar examples of global activities having an environmental impact, of course, and, and you will know this from the, your geography uh, lessons. Uh, asparagus from Peru, very well known. But the amount of water in asparagus, the amount of water in cucumbers, uh, even in potatoes, yeah, they're, they're full of water, and actually that water is, is transported around the world. It's a global commodity. We also know that using water to produce those crops uh, cotton is a very famous one, meat, vegetable oils, increases demand on local water resources. So immediately, as, as, you know, as global consumers, we're, we're, we're using things in one part of the world, but the impact on local water, water resources is found elsewhere. And there's another example, carbon emissions, the tourist industry, expanding flights. Um, and there's uh, the Etihad having, a, having a, a sale for fantastic holidays. And interesting how the, 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 air, air, the airwaves and the airlines have had such a reduced uh, activity during lockdowns. So some airports are almost empty now. And that has actually had a major impact on, on carbon emissions. And of course, carbon emissions are, are, are global. So the global economy and global activities have very, very clear impact on, on, the, on the environment. Just a few examples to, to whiz through. And this comes from um, the work I was doing in, in 2012, all that time ago. That's why I get a bit frustrated with it, really. Look at the overfishing. And look what happened in, uh, it, this is just in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and look what happened between 1990 and 2000. Fish stocks absolutely went through the floor. Papua New Guinea, the, 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 the um, hardwood, the logging that's occurring in the tropical rainforest. Um, chest freezers. Now, we went on holiday to the Gambia one, one Easter uh, a few years ago. And now this is a great, a great film. This is, I wanted to know what happened to my chest freezer when a, a new one was delivered and, and the, the company said, oh, we'll take it away and we'll, re, we'll, um, we'll recycle it for you. And this is where it ended up. So our waste has ended up on the west coast of Africa as a complete eyesore. Um, I bet you didn't even think about that. Um, uh, I've got a bit of background noise. I hope, hope you can hear me. Do try and interrupt if you can't. Um, and then in 1990, we had this scandal in the U where the UK sent 90 containers of rubbish um, over to Brazil. And Brazil, quite rightly, sent it back to us with a flea in, in our ear because they weren't going to uh, receive our rubbish. Computers. Uh, when I was doing some work in Accra in, in Ghana, this was a, quite a famous e-waste dump called Aglablishi uh, in Accra. Um, and it's full of really polluted fumes and, and the landscape is very dangerous one. But just look at the photograph on the right. You might be able to make out London Guildhall University. So the labels are giving away that many of the things that we've had in the UK and we were giving, we were trying to get rid of them, end up in uh, parts of the world which are actually out of our sight. 
Um, you may have studied a little bit of India, but probably not aware that on the northeast coast, northwest coast, I'm sorry, of India, um, in Gujarat province, um, there is an area called Alang, and that's the world's largest graveyard for ships. What do you do when the world has finished uh, with its ships that have been uh, transferring global products around the world? And think of the pollution actually in uh, dismantling them. Then there's China. What, what did we do until quite recently? China was taking um, shiploads, tanker loads of our plastics uh, and our bottles. Um, and then it, you've probably seen photographs in many developing city slums where the poor are sitting among waste, their own waste and our waste, and actually making a business out of somebody else's pollution. So, you know, waste um, is, is a global problem. And the richer we get, uh, the, the more waste we produce. And I don't make any excuses for including this simple graph on the left-hand side. It was published in 1999 and it was predicted, projection to 2020, and that is absolutely proven to be the case. Where we are getting richer, we produce more waste per head of population. And where does it go? Well, I'll put this map in and a couple more others um, because A-level students love maps and it's good for you to interrogate them so I'm not going to sit around here for very long tearing this apart but you can look on YouTube and, and, and pick out some of these and see what you make of it but clearly this you know who gets the trash Southeast Asia gets a lot of, of what we uh, get rid of waste trafficking it's described as which is rather rather nice from America and, and, uh, and Canada and Western Europe and it ends up um, where illegal waste dumping is in the red in the red zone, uh, and associated also with conflict areas. Uh, and finally, this got another complicated map, but it's for you to interrogate later if you wish. You can see the big circles there, which are the waste generators, and the black lines are taking the waste to places like Pakistan, India, West Africa. You can see China, um, the Southeast Asian countries. So, to, to my mind, it's this. You know, over the years, uh, the waste has been out of sight, out of mind. And globalization in all its forms has contributed, contributed to this. So it's having a major impact on the environment. Now, the other thing which I suppose I, I find very, very frustrating is that actually over the last 50 years, we were warned about this. So way back in the 60s, there were two very famous books called Silent Spring and Limits to Growth. When I started teaching in 76, that was one of the books that I had with my A-level students and we, you know, we took it to bits and it was all the future and now the future is here. And in the 1970s, we talked about, we had uh, uh, big uh, NGOs, World Wildlife, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace and so on. They were putting out this message that globalization is gonna have a major impact on the environment. And we got very excited and, and then anxious in the 1980s about the, the ozone holes and the pollution. Um, we, we created the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, Convention on Climate Change, and of course the World Council for Sustainable Development. Big organizations were looking all that time ago on, on the impact of um, environmental change on, on, global, on globalization. And in the 1990s, we had a, a kind of a decade of UN conferences and conventions, and you've probably heard of, um, of, of the Earth Summit, but it was preceded in 1972 by the United Nations Conference on the Environment. And that was the conference which led to United Nations um, Environment Programme, UNEP. But when we got to 1992, uh, it's the, uh, the brunt and definition of sustainable development. Um, I had low expectations of this conference and all of them were met, Jonathan Porritt uh, was saying, you know, it, we have, we've got big, kind of, people coming together, talking about the environment, you know what, not a lot has happened. Uh, and then in 2002, we had Hannesburg, sustainable development, uh, and everybody's kind of willing at the very highest level to talk about these things, and perhaps willing to have some treaties, have some agreements internationally. And there you can see there's a couple 
in the Baal Convention on Hazardous Waste and the Banagal Convention on, on Hazardous Waste. So just look at the next slide. You don't have to read it all. All I did here was go onto Google and, and a list of international treaties and institutions. And I just went from A to C, and that's all I could get on the page. And there's, that, there's hundreds and hundreds more. So over the last 40 years or so, we have tried very hard to have all these different conventions and agreements to try and control the environment and, and protect the environment at a global level because globalization was seen as the way forward and people working together. But to my mind, you, you may well disagree, but to my mind, not, but not very many of these have been particularly effective. And at the end of the day, there's a bit of a problem. We've got a collision course between the global north and the global south. Now, try to follow my argument here. The global south um, sees that human development, their human needs, their, their economic growth is more important than the environment. They see poverty reduction as being more important, even though poverty, uh, well, because poverty is the driver of environmental problems and soil, soil erosion and water scarcity and so on. So the Global South want to use their resources at the national level, their national priorities to reduce poverty. They don't see their global resources, their national resources as being part of, of, the, of, the, of the globe. Then the Global North don't see it like that. The Global North think that the and resources in the developing world should be protected for everybody's good. The poor countries' resources, if they were global, then so should the economic, political power, industry, financial controls also be global. And, and you and I know that actually it's the global north that holds the economic strings. It's the global north that has the political power. It's the global north that has the financial controls. So the global north wants all those things, but it wants the resources to be global. And poor countries want to use their resources for their own poverty reduction. And for for the global north to change their attitude is, is, is just it's not going to happen. So there's going to be this struggle all the, all the time between the balance of the north and the south. So if we think globalization is essentially about capitalism and about trade, is trade, is economic development a bad thing? Most poor countries want to develop, they want to grow their economies, they want to improve their standard of living, and then they'll say, OK, let's do that. And we'll worry about the environment when we can afford to do so. Which is a, a reasonable argument. But actually, if, even if they have economic growth, it doesn't mean that environmental issues will eventually be addressed. So they're, they're thinking that they want to grow their economies, but actually there's no guarantee that the environmental issues and environmental protection will catch up later. And equally, environmental protection can lead to economic stagnation. Uh, you, could, you could have a situation where the environmental protection control... Oh, no, you've got a situation where the environmental protective agency did not work. How many people are The environmental... Sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback here. I'm getting all kinds of languages here. Um, Environment, environmental protection it can be so strict that actually there's no room for economic growth. So a balance has to be had. So there's a couple of examples for you. Poor women and child labourers assembling photovoltaic panels in Cambodia. I mean, the, the panels are going to be produced very cheaply. They're shipped over to us so we can have um, solar energy and we can keep our nice and clean environment. But meanwhile, child labour, they're be, being produced very, very cheaply, they're not earning a fair wage. How can their, the economy in Cambodia really grow when we're demanding panels which are really so cheap? Another one, the dispossessed. Rural communities are, are removed to make way for wind farms or HEP. Now we might think that's a fantastic idea. HEP flood, HEP flood the valleys, cheap, sustainable energy, 
good news. But what about those people? Three Gorges Down is a classic, I suppose. What about those people in China who were dispossessed, who lost their communities? What happens to them? So here is a moral question for you. How do you get development and environmental sustainability um, where in a world where there's still inequality and international injustice? And that's a that's a, a problem that you might want to go away and, and consider because it's completely tied up with globalization. So does the econ global economy create environmental problems? What about that question? Well, trade and profits are important and big global firms want to make more money. And in so doing, they don't want to have to pay for environmental issues. So the environmental bit gets, goes further and further down the agenda. If you have trade liberalization, where you have much more free trade, trade will go and those companies will go to the places where there are poor environmental controls. So uh, Bhopal, for instance, uh, a city in India, it was, a, it was a, a international company called Union Carbide. Um, they were producing chemicals they located in India, in Bhopal, where environmental restrictions and policies were very, were very lax. And um, so they were allowed to by the Indian government, and then it was, there was an um, absolutely massive explosion and an environmental disaster. You've probably heard of it, but it's the it's the impact of liberal liberalisation of trade. And local people are at the end of all these these big global forces, and it's really really difficult for local people to actually respond and and have some action against big global traders. You know, national governments perhaps would you would expect would support them at a local level, but actually the national governments in the developing world want to have these big firms to come and invest in their country. So it is problematic. You know, big global firms are an asset to some national governments because they bring in money. So are the impacts of climate change made worse by the global economy and by, by globalization? Well, you have foreign direct investment, it pours into the global south. Emerging economies, um, they, they want to have investment. Uh, the, the, the big global transnational firms see the cheap labor, uh, they want to utilize it. They see the, uh, the global south as new consumers, so that's really good news. Um, but actually, it, it's quite interesting. There's a, there's a firm called McKinsey, and uh, you can look at them on Google, and they're an international firm, and they're effectively a research institute, and they produce some really interesting reports on various things. And, and I read in, in one of the reports um, about, about uh, growing cities and risk, and um, they quoted that 84 out of the 100, world, the 100 world's fastest growing cities are at extreme risk because they're on low-lying land, they're in areas where there's, they're going to suffer um, hurricanes and monsoons and rising sea levels and so on. Now, transnational corporations invest in fast-growing cities. So McKinsey was saying to transnational corporations, you need to be careful because your global investments are in these cities which are at extreme risk. And these cities have poor quality infrastructure, and it's very vulnerable to climatic hazards. Your assets could be destroyed. If you have a, um, well, look at, look at the, um, uh, a, a monsoon in cities which are ravaged, a flood of, uh, you know, annually. Um, what's gonna happen to their consumer demand for electrical goods when there's no electricity supply, for instance? So there's, there's an issue there that transnational corporations are investing in areas which are very, very risky. Um, another quote, 95% of 234 cities that at the highest risk of uh, the, the negative impacts of climate change are in Africa and Asia. And 86% of the low risk countries, low risk of, of climate change are in Europe. So in terms of globalization, where you have big firms, investing in cities in the developing world, that, that that is leading to a greater risk. 
On the other hand, you could argue that actually globalization and global trade could do good things. It could really improve the environment. And you've probably heard of the polluter pays principle. So this would say that if you're a successful firm, you're going to make money from trade and that money, those gains will be sufficient to pay for environmental protection. And that can only be a good thing. If you are a firm that's prepared to pay and you've got a legal requirement to do so. There's also an argument that the more you trade, you could take your, the, 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 the mechanism, that the technology that you use in trading, and you could use that in investment in the developing world to, take, to, to increase efficiency and productivity in the developing world and use that cleaner technology. And then that's going to be a win for the company and a win for the, the, the receiving country, if you wish, the, the receiving city for the clean technology. So you could see it that way. You could see it, this is also true, that trade can put a value on the environment. Now, I, was, I remember writing some years ago an exam question, a case study uh, for students at A-level, and it was about water in Jakarta. And uh, Jakarta had a terrible water supply problems and, not, and the, the Indonesian government couldn't afford to, to supply water to everywhere. So, it, so basically, through the World Bank and structure adjustment, it was selling its water provision and sold it half to Veolia and half to Thames Water. And that in itself, the water resources and the water provision became a part of a private enterprise and it, and it put a value on water and it made people have to pay for their water out of a tap or wherever. Now, there's a moral issue there. It's water is a, a basic need. Should the poorest people have to pay for their water when it's, it's fundamental to our existence? But the Indonesian government felt that there was in that trade-off that private firms came and they, they put in the infrastructure and they ran the water supply, that that was putting a value on the environment and therefore the people in, in Jakarta would use it more carefully. So that or not have it at all. And a fourth issue there to talk about is, is perhaps international cooperation. Tra there was a global ivory trade. And we all know it is really bad news, but international cooperation, i.e. global countries coming together, putting sanctions together and implementing sanctions could actually have a terrific effect on, 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 on environmental um, uh, protection and environmental awareness. And have conservation, and that was that has been very successful. Now, just put this on because um, it's I think it's quite interesting. Two different ways of, of, of looking at it. You could talk about um, a thesis, a uh, hypothesis. Uh, uh, are you a pollution haven? Now, a pollution haven uh, is where polluting firms in in more economically developed countries relocate to the weak countries. They've got lax regulations, a bit like carbon. Uh, um, uh, oh, um, I've forgotten the firm in India, Union Carbide. Um, and actually, the MEDCs themselves become cleaner. So the the, the, the global north, the, the economic, the developed countries are a pollution haven, haven because they have sent all their pollution across to the developing world. Or you could see it as a pollution halo. So here you have foreign direct investment leading to a transfer of good practice to poorer countries. And they, that good practice consists of new investment, using energy efficient sources, you can see it there, lower carbon emissions. And the foreign direct, direct investment itself fosters environmentally friendly technologies. So that globalization is, it gives a bit of a pollution halo to that particular firm, but that, because that transfer of technology has meant good news in the developing world. So they feel really rather good about themselves because they're actually transferring good practice as opposed to the pollution haven where the MEDCs are clean and they're getting rid of their pollution and effectively they're saying, well, we're okay, I'm back out of sight, out of mind. So this is a global challenge. We've got globalization on one hand, we've got the environment on the other and somehow in the middle, we've got accountability and enforcement and who's going to do it and why is it so so difficult 
Well, just want to think about a few examples, uh, because globalization is intrinsically linked to capitalism. Now, here we got uh, globalization essentially represented by our container ship. And if you're producing stuff around the world, there are lots of different ways in which you know people are, are working in different ways. So we've got working lives, wages, working conditions. We've got different types of working places, from local up to national. We've got different rules. Sometimes they're formal, sometimes it's informal. We've got contracts, we've got different firms, we've got really big guns, state enterprises, we've got family owned, and we've got strong or lax environmental conditions. So we've got lots and lots of different um, aspects working to produce stuff. But the common thread with all of them is to keep costs, costs down. But within all that, behind that simple your simple words on the screen are incredible levels of complexity. And that, that's perhaps part of the problem. You probably, I mean, I think you probably agree with me that capitalism leads to overconsumption. Well, capitalism means a firm wants to make more money and it makes more money by advertising its wares. So you've got to buy this Apple. Apple set, used a new phone. You don't really need a new phone. It's a new phone and it's a new new brand, it's a new version. So we buy a new phone. And that happens thousands and thousands of times over. So we, we have more than we need and we consume more than we need. So that's kind of a truism. Um, we could say, I think you probably would agree that globalization spawns international advertising, that you can go anywhere around the world and you'll see the big McDonald's Archer sign or Coca-Cola and um, you know, people are exploiting uh, advertising, the social media's out there, absolutely everywhere, we're more connected. And we've got a lot of stuff in the North and it's, it's really saying to the Global South, be like us, aspire to be more Western, aspire to have more of the stuff that we have. So that's kind of one element of globalization. It's, it's, it's encouraging us to have more stuff. And I'm just trying to suggest to you that making more stuff actually is very complicated. It's quite a long chain. But we've also got people, probably not many of you listening, uh, who are thinking about fair trade and sweatshop free goods and thinking about rainforest friendly products and sustainability and ecological footprint and so on. And that's really good too. But the problem is the global commodity chain is very, it's too complicated. It's, it's, it's around the world, but it's also, you can't see through it. There are too many links in the chain. It's very opaque. So the problem is that capitalism is, is not actually um, helping us see our way through to be more economically, um, um, environmentally friendly. Now, I just want to illustrate that with just three very quick examples. I mean, I bet you've heard of KFC, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut. Yeah, I'm sure you have. You've probably eaten in all of them. Uh, but I bet you haven't heard of Yum. Now, Yum is a multinational firm which owns KFC, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut. And Yum and all of the, and the other three sub subsidiaries survive on producing a standard product. Now, they are around the world, 49,000 uh, outlets um, that are under the auspices of Yum. How do you make sure that every single one of those around the world has a standardized product that you are going to like? So you go into pizza anywhere in the world and you know you're going to get a type of pizza. And the way they do it is to ensure that you have large scale production. That, in, that means a lot of chemicals, it means a lot of pesticides, it means using the same flavors, the same sourcing, and it's, it's actually adding to the globalized movement of goods around the world and globalized consumption. But you can't talk about globalization and the environment without talking about fashion. It, it, fashion is up, up there with the, with the big guns. It's gotta be the ultimate. Uh, global industry um, and look at all the, the the metrics you've probably done some work on this already perhaps uh, you know lower down, lower down the school but you know 7,500 liters of liters of water to make a pair of jeans uh eight percent of greenhouse gases global wastewater 
the 500,000 tons of microfiber equivalent to 3 million barrels of oil, et cetera, every year. It's absolutely massive. Um, and you can see there's, a, there's a, uh, some references below the screen, which you'll get on, I think, on YouTube, um, where you can, you can see this article, that special edition in the, in the Guardian, where I got those, those hangers from. 8% of all carbon emissions worldwide. A third of those uh, carbon emissions come just out of one country, which is China. 1.2 billion tons a year of greenhouse gases produced by the clothing industry. So it's really not very good news. And you know, to my mind, one of the problems is we just have to produce less. Um, and, and this is kind of a criticism of, okay, here's me, old and retired, and I can be really frumpy and say, you know, okay, I don't have to have lots of different clothes, I don't go out clubbing or whatever, but I don't have to have, have, have that many clothes. And young people love clothes. Um, but actually, it would be better if we produced less and we bought less, because consumers drive things. And I mean, I speak from the heart here because there's a quandary. How do brands such as Boohoo and Pretty Little Thing grow their business and manage their environmental footprint? Now, my dear son, who I love dearly, um, used to be on the financial um, uh, team at Boohoo, based in Manchester. And I used to say to him, Aidan, how can you do this? How can you work for Boohoo to manage? You know, how, what can you do? And he was trying to change it, you know, lift it from the inside. But they were producing huge numbers of really cheap clothes and you're probably wearing some as, as I speak now um, but their, their ecological footprint is, is, is really big uh, or their environmental footprint rather and because the chain is so complicated whether it's for buttons or zips or dyes or whatever it's really difficult to keep control of the environmental impact that they have. And, you know, one of the things that the, the fashion industry needs to do is to, is to kind of, they might want to balance their environmental footprint with, with growing their business, but that's really very difficult. Some firms are trying to use uh, uh, less plastic and make sure they transfer to, to renewable energy, um, but, but it's very difficult. And, and you look at the white box on the right. The fashion industry is worth 32 billion pounds to our economy. So it's not a slip, it's not no pun intended. Um, it's a lot of money. And we buy the most clothes and we throw more than 11 million tons of landfill uh, to landfill every, every year. I mean, that's that's incredible amount of, of clothes just thrown away. Uh, so actually the fashion industry has got a lot to think about. You know, it's a global industry. Um, it's it's lovely that firms in the developing world perhaps should have jobs, provide jobs for making clothes, but actually we have too many. Um, and the commodity chain is long, complex and hard to control. And there's a link at the bottom here of the UN. They had a, an interesting page there um, about trying to clean up the fashion industry. And they're, they're working with the fashion industry to, to try and improve the, the image really. And, and there are some solutions for the fashion industry. Of course, you could buy less, you could buy better and make it, and you could sell better and make it last longer. Um, second time in September, you may have heard of, um, uh, there's a, a Maria Carriejo in uh, Spain is using ca uh, car seat leathers um, in, in, um, in clothes, H&M, Patagonia using recycled bottles, etc. Uh, and of course, in, in last year, in 2019, Extinction Rebellion um, did a really good job in uh, interrupting or disrupting uh, London Fashion Week to make the point that the fashion industry, you know, a big global industry, is having a terrific effect on the environment negatively. And the third industry, so we've looked at food, looked at fashion, couldn't not look at oil really, just one screen. We want oil from countries in the global south. But the problem is that those oil producing countries often are lacking in skills and expertise. They are often corrupt. They're not very transparent. They're not always terribly accountable. They've got what we call weak institutions and weak governance. Um, they have, they have a, a, a critical global resource that the developed world wants a lot of, and they haven't got the power to hold the big oil companies 
to, to account. Poor countries need the trade, but they haven't got the power or the influence or the governance, the, the economic weight, if you like, to hold the global oil companies to account. And, you know, I can go back into the 80s and think about uh, 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 Shell in Nigeria um, and the, the various uh, oil spills that have been in Alaska and, and the, uh, the Arctic uh, North Coast and, and so on. So it's uh, oil is a, is a big problem. It's, a glo it's global, but it's one of the in, uh, great environmental polluters. So, I mean, I'm saying to you, is anybody out there? We've, we've got all this evidence. We know there's a tension between development and aspiring to be having a higher standard of living and you know, the global north you know, wanting consumer goods. But I, I just wonder who, is anybody out there listening? And actually, is there any good news at all? And, and one, of the, one of the other problems is that actually the global environmental governance is, is really being, uh, is very weak. The United Nations, I, I love the United Nations, used to have students regularly to the UN in Geneva, and they do try, but they're not strong. Many of the institutions are only as good as the amount of money they have, and they can pass lots and lots of resolutions, all those conventions that you saw earlier on. But actually, if what, what's the what the comeback on the country if you if you don't you don't obey by the rules? You know, they, 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 you can't excommunicate a country. You know, there, there's no pushback. Um, often there's very poor coordination. And, and increasingly, we are beginning to question what the terms common security means. What is, what is national security? Um, what is environmental security? You know, does it, is, it, is national security something that's just for us in the UK or the US or, or France or whatever? Is it just OK for us to look after ourselves? Or can we see national security as part of the bigger picture? If there's global secu security, then nationally, we too will be secure. So there's, there's, there's interesting discussions there to be had about the, the, the relationship between global security and, and national security, environmentally, politically, uh, economically, and, and so on. Governments and global firms. Um, some global companies are absolutely huge. We know that. You just have to look at the Apple, the, the Microsoft, Amazon, they're the big guns, and they've got more clout than some governments. So how do governments begin to hold Amazon and, and Apple for instance, to account? We can't in the UK, we can't even hold them to account in terms of their paying their tax. So how on earth can we do that in terms of um, environmental good practice. So the, the, the problem globally with global governance is there are lots and lots of uh, uh, treaties, but actually, you know, is it the end of the world if one or two countries don't comply? You know, it, it, it's quite easy to slip under the radar and countries actually don't always toe, toe the line. And don't, uh, there, there is an, there's something in the paper this morning actually about, about was it yesterday, about arms and British arms trade around the world, and, and that's, a, that's a rather grey area, and arms companies, arms trading companies, somehow get on under the radar. We've signed a treaty, but somehow things keep on happening. So you can have as many global ag agreements as you like, but things will fall through the gaps. And the Friends of the Earth have a, have a, 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 a view. They call it failed collective action, fragmentation, deficient authority, insufficient legitimacy of, 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 the, of the global community. And that's pretty, that's pretty damning. So actually, this makes me feel pretty, pretty depressed, to be honest. So I'm searching for some good news, and, and we do have some. And, and we do know that there are, there are activists around the world. We know there's Extinction Rebellion, there are global campaigns and pressure groups, and, and there's lots more information if we care to respond to it. So there is some good news out there. Having said that, of course, you might have heard of compassion fatigue. You know, how often, uh, dread to think, but how, you know, how often do we say, you know, clap for carers and the NHS, we, 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 we love the NHS, they've done wonderful things, but how long will it be if it gets into 2021 and we're still suffering uh, you know, COVID uh, and 
for uh, lockdowns and so on, how tired will we be? Are you, do you lack faith? Do we, do you, are you beginning to think like me that I have lack of faith in anything changing and you get a bit apathetic? And actually we risk self-interest. You know, we want our clothes. We want to be able to get in our cars and drive with the oil which has been produced somewhere else. We want to have an, in a new phone. Um, never mind about the waste of the old one. It's not on our radar. It's out of sight, out of mind. So there's a risk of us being in our little bubbles uh, and being full of self-interest. Um, however, despite the risks, we're familiar with all of these. We know that sustainable development goals are, are looming, perhaps too quickly, we don't need only another 10 years. The World Economic Forum is there thinking about uh, uh, big companies coming together and there's Greta Thunberg talking to them, saying you've got to consider climate change. David Attenborough is, 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 is just telling us, begging us to make some impact and take some responsibility, individual responsibility. We can do it. And if you saw the last program, uh, his, own last, his last program, the first part was about, um, about the, the problem, about the history and the problems we had. But the last third or so was about solutions. And I found that really, really encouraging. Then there's you know blue blue, blue planet um, program twelve. You have a series of twelve programs, and the last one turned out to make the world jump up and down about plastics in the oceans. It was an extraordinary achievement that one hour's television could change the way we start talking about plastics. So it, that was a, a fantastic achievement, um, and you can see veganuary veganuary that lots of people are thinking about what they're what they're eating. Um, and what they're wearing and how we can respond to climate emergencies. Local authorities, uh, field cities councils, got climate emergency and they're taking it on board and taking it more seriously. And we just put at the bottom there, Chris Packham, uh, because he wrote a very, very interesting piece in January and it's called Trouble in Paradise. And his view with that was that that we've had all these wonderful environmental programs, David Amber included, bringing extraordinary, beautiful wildlife to our screens and our living rooms. We can see nature and how wonderful it is and how clever it is and adaptations and we all marvel at, at, at it. And Chris Patton is saying, hang on, have we seen too much of perfection? Should we not have been saying, these are wonderful things and you know what you're destroying it all uh, you know he had it and i think he had a case that we've sort of grown up to these wonderful nature programs and get really excited country file this is great you know that all different things every week on a sunday evening and you think, oh yes but actually underlying all that there are serious problems and perhaps it's making it too glossy and you know fairy story like and, and it looks too wonderful and perhaps it's it perhaps it stops us worrying about the environment. So I've got some questions for you. Uh, is economic integration through trade and investment a threat to the environment? Uh, does trade undermine the, regulation, re, re, the regulations of national governments to control pollution? How much can we expect governments and institutions and corporations to, to actually do to solve the, the environmental problem? what's going to be better? Um, how, how do we actually address economic growth and social growth, which is, which is what you would expect for the very poorest people who are living in appalling slum conditions in the global south, but also have environmental justice and, you know, and do that at the same time. And I could add in there how to make it sustainable. So there's some really big questions. And at the bottom, that's the, the, the key question of all. Where does the power for change lie? Is it with governments? Is it with the international community in the form of the UN? Is it, uh, is it with big corporations? You know, is it Apple's responsibility? Is it us? What happens? You know, what part should we play? I could go, no, oh, this is just awful. I don't know where to turn next. Or I could say, don't panic. Uh, it'll all be all right on the night. You know, we'll just keep going and it'll be fine. And, you know, it's not, not going to be on my patch. I'll do my little bit. Um, we're all going to be okay. Uh, but actually, we have to do something. 
we've got to do our bit. But the key thing is, to be honest, do we have the will to do it? You know, do, do we have a will personally? Uh, do we have it in our, in our, in our parliaments? Um, do we have it internationally? Um, and and here's, a, here's a group of people at the international level. It is the decade of action. Make the 2020s the decade uh, of action and 2020 the year of urgency to, to get to the sustainable development goals. And that includes uh, environmental protection and conservation and to try and to try and harness globalization for good rather than for bad. So we need to do our bit, but actually, do we have the will? So my question to you, if you're still there and I'm looking at my screen, globalization in the environment, is anyone listening? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jill. And if there is anybody who would like to ask some questions, could you put them in the chat now and I'll ask Jill if she'd like to address them. Um, we have Bruce Cadbury who has written, first of all, to note that McKinsey and Company is an American worldwide management consultancy firm, not a research organization. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah, they, but they produce wonderful research reports and um, in the academic world they're held in, in reasonable, uh, in quite high regard. Um, and, if, and they're freely available as well with, with, and they produce graphs and you might not want to read their uh, take on the graphs but you can certainly see their evidence. He also notes that 5% of the total carbon emissions are from the US military and wonders why we don't talk about militarism as well as oil, fashion and waste. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right, Bruce, but I had, I had 50 minutes. <laughs> so, I was just looking at the ones where young people perhaps would recognize more, uh, but I, I agree. I think if you go back to the, um, those uh, waste graphs, you will see the, the armaments and so on, which is being spread around the world, that's the, uh, there's another, what do I think is a solution to all of this? Should activist groups be pressuring companies? Yes, well, and the UN, et cetera, or is it, well, someone's got to do something. And yes, and I think actually the most, the most effective pressure group are the consumers. You know, just going back to, 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 the, to the military issue, if we didn't buy, the countries didn't buy the stuff in the first place, there would be, there would be no market. You know, if you if you if you if you take away the market for particular thing, um, then you do have with look at the people um, probably about 15 years ago and uh, there was an issue about gap, and people realized that the gap commodity train was really not good news in terms of exploitation. And Oxfam had a, had a lovely advert, sweatshirt, not sweatshop. And you know, and, and consumers were, were standing outside not dissuading people from buying gap things this is the same with with coffee and, and starbucks uh so people can vote with their feet because it's consumers um it, and not the only answer but it's something we can all do uh looking at this would, uh, pam would you yeah. agree that we need a much more political focus on environmental citizenship instead of considering it typically in small consumerism and behavioral terms um Yes, uh, we do need political focus, but actually, um, what, the, what are the politicians going to do in this country? They're just going to tell us to do something. They're going to they're going to pass a law, and we have to do it ourselves. Recycling. I have got to go out and buy. Um, oh, well, this is where the politics came in. You know, that we we had a restriction on the old-fashioned light bulbs, and but the politicians decided we will not make any more of those light bulbs. But we've got to go out and buy energy efficient light bulbs we have got to physically put go to the recycling and and think about how we get rid of our waste that way so yes politicians can make the the, the bigger decisions but we've got to buy into them so i think it's got to happen like a pincer movement uh would you say the social media uh is very powerful you bet it is mm. absolutely and the more we get out there 
you young folk who are really great at social media, it, absolutely. And if it means making people like me guilty, because, you know, we're old and we've been spendthrift on resources, you just go ahead. Um, what else have we got there? Consumers can sign up to consigns uh, and refuse to allow their taxes to go towards defense. Yep, they can do. Um, I have a friend who's done that, but I just don't know whether that actually happens in real life. It's a, it's a step in the right direction. I'd love to see this, the, the, <coughs> the poverty train. So it's time for a try storming. After decades of brainstorming, how do we start to change consumers' habits, habits more globally? Mm -hmm. Now, there is a tricky one. How can you say to people in the developing world, <coughs> don't buy some, um, don't buy some Western, Western goods? Um, telephone. Don't buy, don't buy any telephone. They need telephones for, say, in Kenya, for trade. You know, I've been with women in very rural communities connected with my microfinance uh, work um, where that phone is absolutely fundamental to them being able to um, have, have um, uh, banking and they can do it via their phone but they need <coughs> to have a phone and they need to have a phone that works and they need to have a phone that's going to take the newest software so that they can actually mine, you know, manage their finances and so on so it's really tricky we, you know it's okay for us to say yes we should limit consumerism when we've got the stuff already mm -hmm. There's a, there's a really great TED talk by Hans Rosling. And um, it, it's, it's an old one now. I mean, I used to use it like, it was probably about 20 years ago, but he's on he's, you know, the TED talks. And, uh, <coughs> and he talks about uh, population growth and using resources. And he ends up um, with a washing machine on the stage. And he's saying to him, look, my granddad, <laughs> in Finland or wherever it was, didn't have a washing machine, but she spent all her time washing. She didn't have time to learn. But when she had a washing machine, she could put the washing in and then she had time to read books and so on. And, you know, she could actually develop in that way. And she was thrilled to have a washing machine. So, you know, there is some, we could perhaps have a, an interesting debate about which goods we really need to have and which things we can perhaps do without. Um, Karina, what do you think is the most effective way for us to raise awareness of globalization to our family and friends? Well, oh, golly. Well, you don't want to be thrown out of the house before Christmas, do you? That would be <laughs> for, for nagging them. But perhaps example, showing by example. If you're a young person, perhaps consider the labels on the clothes that you buy. We can't all solve everything. But if we all did a bit, it would be a step in the right direction. But things like clothes, food, local shopping, uh, less trans, you know, walking and less uh, needless journeys on, by car, perhaps that would be a way of trying to get families and friends to, to recognize it. Good thing from Bruce Cadbury again to everyone. Make your yeah, uh, Mel, how much of our environmental footprint comes from our UK farming methods? Don't mm. Very don't know. Probably, mm, not sure actually, um, but that's, that's quite an interesting one because when people talk about farmers going back to where it was before, you've got to be careful what you wish for because if they were going back to smaller fields, the price there would be it would be less efficient um we want cheap food you want reliable food and in brexit we absolutely want to have food full stop so how are we going to balance um the environmental footprint with the need to be more efficient and, and mm. increase productivity uh thank you melanie talk to you later on that one <laughs> and miles too yeah yep High food production costs, increased food, but yeah, yeah, yeah. How should the UK government ensure food poverty does not rise to higher food costs, yet not simply export our problems? You are absolutely right. I mean, perhaps we should, perhaps we should all just get an allotment. And perhaps we should, perhaps it's to do with our expectation of food. 
the number of cases we, grew by 11 percent. Do we need year, to have strawberries in the winter? Do we need so to have kiwi fruit? I mean, I was talking to my... It shows my, that the national restrictions have been successful. And what, what this means in practice is that... I've got another sound somewhere. In ...respecting the national lockdown and through everything that... Uh, there's another... Is that quiet? Okay. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, what was that? About food. I can't think what I was saying. Got a bit distracted that throughout the sound. Um, to our food. Yes. Yeah, um, <clears throat> how should Sorry. we ensure food poverty does not rise through yeah. higher food costs and not okay. yes, simply yeah. export our problems? Yeah. Look. Oh, I know. Yes, I know what it was. I mean, perhaps. Perhaps we are. It's about our expectations of what we do eat. Do we need to have all things available all year? Or should we be more seasonally, eat more locally? Um, I mean, even if even if we do eat from supermarkets, we don't have to necessarily go to our local vegetable shop or whatever. Even if we did use UK yeah. supermarkets, we could eat UK produced food mm. rather than, and that might actually be the case if stuff is going to be rotting on the quayside in Dover or Calais or whatever. But, you know, there's this expectation that we have plums and, you know, and fresh food. I notice an interest in... in in uh, the supermarkets at the moment, you know, there, there are no um, uh, apri apricots and nectarines and um, pear and um, peaches. And actually, you know, I like me, I like peaches and I like, love nectarines, but you know what, that's okay. Because when the season comes, they'll be back. And uh, on the other hand, Here's, this, is the, this is the sting in the tail, really. There are countries like Kenya, like Uganda, um, Mozambique to a certain extent now, um, Ghana, who are producing food from the tropics to sell to us, and that's what they've got to sell on the, you know, that's how they make some money. So we could stop importing food, but actually what are we doing to their economies? You cannot have a diet of pineapples in Ghana you've got to have other things or coffee or whatever. So, you know, we do have to balance that with supporting developing world economies too. That's really, really tricky. Do you think supply chains are too interdependent for change to happen? Yes, I do. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I once did some work um, on some supply chains for fair trade goods, fair trade, mind you. And by golly, it was complicated. And you know, when and I was, I was, I started thinking about when you go to these catalogues, um, at least, you know, they, they all, they all, uh, Christine Aid, Oxfam, you know, all the charity catalogues, and they all had the same stuff. And all, how come you're all selling the same things? Um, and it's, it's turned out to be their quality chains were were really, really complicated. And actually, we were telling or the big firms, the big charities were telling their cooperatives in the developing world what to make because they knew what we would buy. Um, so that was a, a, you know, another link in the chain. So it's really difficult. Um, but I don't know how we undo the interdependency. It's like getting a ball of wool and a cat. You know, I, I don't think you'll ever get there. Short of having an allotment and going and picking your own, that's got to be the shortest food chain, isn't it? Or making your own clothes. Or recycling your clothes. Mm. Um, do I know of a research group that analyzes consumer psychology? No, I don't. Uh, what kinds of methods can be used by companies to consumers? Mm, I don't know, but I'm happy to research that. And if any, but it's to everyone. So if anyone has got them, please do let us all know. Um, and there's the map, the food miles. Thanks for that, for that, Brendan. That's good. One of my greatest victories: making my plan to stop buying strawberries. Yes, in December. Brilliant. Uh, as an undergraduate, how would you recommend those who wish to get more involved and expand their knowledge to do so? Um, and this topic uh, on food, oh, well, there are there are some really good books out there. I think Global Justice Now is probably uh, one of the most proactive charities, and you will have a Global Justice Now branch in the northeast. I'm sure you will if you are living in the northeast. We've certainly got one um, on the Wirral here. Um, and they're, they're very proactive. Calculate your own, calculate your own paw print, yeah, why not? 
Oh, there's a lot of really good questions there, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you listening. That's nice. And thank you very much, Jill, for giving us such a really interesting talk and for it for responding so well to all the questions. And I'm sure everybody's gained quite a lot of different um, aspects of knowledge from it. Well, I hope it's things for you to take away and think about. That was the, there are no easy answers, but uh, it's our young people, you know, our lives are done. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, we can, we've got 20 years left, perhaps. Uh, but actually it's the young people going to take this on board and really, really show us up. We need more, everybody needs to be a Greta Th Thunberg, don't they? They do. So thank you all, everybody, very much for coming along. It's been a fantastic attendance. And I've very much enjoyed listening to both to Jill and to reading all the different questions. Do come along to our future talks. We've got those up on the screen. And do keep in contact with us. If you've enjoyed Jill's, give us more examples of what else you'd like us to talk about. And we're hoping to have Jill back again <laughs> next year. <laughs> I'll be really kind. And this time, because my home is in Tynemouth, which is the centre of the universe, uh, and uh, I'm actually I'm talking at Geo on uh, on Wednesday with the, you know, the Geo the Geo talks. Uh huh. And uh, and that's on um, global institutions. But I've only got half an hour, so I've got to talk even faster. So for, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Anyway, thanks, thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Bye. Bye. <laughs>